This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants me. You're gonna acknowledge me. What's going on, everybody, guys and girls? Welcome back to another edition of the SmackDown Review right here on the WWE Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Michael Ritter. You can find me on Twitter at Michael Five Ritter. And on Instagram at Michael Ritter 5. This is a SmackDown that aired on September. Let me get the date. 24th, 2021. I'm actually recording this at 9.18. That's when I'm starting this recording. So only 18 minutes after SmackDown went off the air. I feel like this was a good SmackDown um, in terms of a go-home show. I felt like it delivered. And just overall, it was a good show. I, I really enjoyed it. There was four matches, and there was a couple really good segments that obviously we're going to cover at some point here in this show. But I did want to hop on here pretty quick after SmackDown ended, though, just to get the episode out and to keep the train rolling. This is a pay-per-view week here on the WWE Podcast, so there's going to be no shortage of, shortage of shows in terms of the SmackDown review, the preview and prediction show, the post-Extreme Rules show that Matt's going to have. So I wanted to do my part in keeping this uh, keeping this train rolling and keeping everything on schedule. So the, um, the beneficiaries are you, the listener, because you're going to get an episode likely earlier than what you would have had this not been a go-home show or a pay-per-view week. I don't know, though. Sometimes I really do like hopping on immediately after because whenever the show's that good, I, I just want to get on here and talk about it. And I feel like there was enough good segments from this show for me to have that feeling. So that's what I'm going to do here. This show took place from, let's see, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I've actually been to Philly. In this specific arena, the Wells Fargo Center Arena, whatever they want to call it, um, it's actually the site of the Royal Rumble 2004, the one that was won by Crispin Wall. That was one of my personal favorite cards. Just in terms of the entire Royal Rumble, there was a lot of good stuff on that one. Hardcore Holly had a match against, I believe it was Brock Lesnar. Yeah, that was actually a pretty personal feud that they had going on. Where Brock Lesnar actually in, er, injured Hardcore Holly, like for real, like really injured his neck. So there was actually some uh, some real stuff in that in that feud that you saw come to the screen in their actual storylines. It was really entertaining, and that was just one of the one of the many many storylines that was going on during that time. But the the main thing was. Goldberg entering number thirty, Crispin Wall entering number one. Everyone thought Goldberg was going to win because he just lost the World Heavyweight Championship at Armageddon, which was a month before that in December. So he was definitely like the favorite, at least in my opinion, on Raw. I mean, they had him, they, when he got the number 30 spot, he was kind of just running rampant through the entire roster. And they even had like a, a pretty big highlight or a video package for him whenever they were doing the the promo before the Royal Rumble match started. So he was the favorite. Brock Lesnar ended up interfering in that one, kind of screwing him over. Kurt Angle ended up throwing him. Brock Lesnar went to the ring, gave Goldberg an F5, and then Kurt Angle threw Goldberg over the ring, so or over the top rope, eliminated him from the Royal Rumble. And then, uh, as you know by now, Chris Wall lasted from 1 all the way to 30, won the thing, went on to WrestleMania. So, I mean, obviously I just got completely off topic just talking about this one arena. And then I'm pretty sure this is the same arena that Roman Reigns won his Royal Rumble in 2015 whenever he got booed out of the or got booed out of the building cuz everybody wanted Daniel Bryan to win that one. And that was the Royal Rumble that I was really excited to see Roman Reigns win. So it was kind of a bittersweet moment for me, obviously knowing that I'm a Roman Reigns fan and always have been a huge Roman Reigns fan, so that was the arena that they were in tonight. Obviously, I mean, you guys know, you talk about wrestling, you just remember specific arenas like this. It can kind of take you back and you remember old events and things like that, or at least me personally. And like I said, whenever I first mentioned that they were in Philly, I've actually been to Philadelphia. I went to watch the Atlanta Falcons play the Philadelphia Eagles. So me and my good buddy Joseph, we went there for, I think it was like four days, and we got to experience the, the city of Philadelphia. Definitely, it's, I, I would recommend going there if you're not a, a visitor, like in terms of like a, like the away team. 
if you go there as an Atlanta Falcons fan playing the Falcons versus Eagles, they're not going to necessarily welcome you with open arms. Let's just say that. But it's still a good a good time there in Philly. I had a Philly cheesesteak from Philadelphia, so I mean that's definitely something that's bucket list material if you if you ever get over there. And I'm sure some of you probably live in Philly and you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm from Texas, so I really don't get to experience that authentic Philly cheesesteak very often. It's actually the only time I've ever had it, so I definitely enjoyed that while I was there. But no more of this off-topic stuff. SmackDown took place in Philadelphia today, September 24th. So it was a good episode, and let's get right to it and talk about it because there is a lot that we have to cover here in terms of the show. And then I'm going to give my preview and predictions for, or not necessarily preview and predictions, but my quick predictions for the card this Sunday at Extreme Rules. So let's get this bad boy rolling here. This SmackDown started with Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair having a little bit of a get you ready for the pay-per-view match this Sunday. And I feel like they both did a pretty good job in terms of their actual promo. Becky came out first and she kind of talked about last week in Knoxville, Tennessee, it being Bianca Belair's hometown, how she didn't want to embarrass her in front of her mom and her dad and her high school teacher in the front row. Bianca definitely took offense to that. And she can't, or she comes out to the ring, tells her to keep her parents' name out of her mouth, and that she would, she proved that she's the strongest woman in WWE by doing what she did to Bianca Belair, basically military pressing her, picking her up over her head while in high heels and five inch heels is what she said. So clearly, if she's in wrestling boots, she can do a lot more damage to Becky Lynch, and I think that we all know that. Um, so that's why this match this Sunday is actually going to be a really good one. Now that there's actually a little bit of a buildup, but. W- What they were saying is Bianca was basically trying to say that it's not going to be the same thing that happened. You know, I'm I'm expecting you now and uh, you're not going to catch me off guard where Becky Lynch was saying, yeah, well, you knew you had a match that day. You you just didn't know that you were going to be facing the greatest woman to ever hold this this specific championship talking about the SmackDown Women's Championship. So she does have a point there. And even later in the show. She actually has a little bit of a backstage promo where she talks about and she points out that she's actually been the SmackDown Women's Champion for as long as she's been an active superstar since WrestleMania 35. So the only time that she hasn't been champion is whenever she obviously left to go take care of her child when she got pregnant. So she was gone for like, what, a year and a half, maybe more. I'm not really sure the exact number there, but she was gone for a while. And she just makes it clear that any time that she's been on the active roster, other than her little intro or her entrance at SummerSlam, and whenever they rang the bell for 26 seconds, that's the only time that she wasn't champion since WrestleMania 35. And we're creeping up to WrestleMania 38. So that, that's pretty big. I mean, especially if you just think back to like previous years. I mean, just, just think back to like WrestleMania 19 to WrestleMania 21. Like, that's a pretty big difference in terms of what was going on in WWE. So for Becky Lynch to be on top for this many consecutive WrestleManias, just looking at it from 35 to 38, although she did take some time off, but it wasn't because her character needed time off. It was because she got pregnant, and she came back, and she's just as hot and likely going to continue on from WrestleMania 38, probably to 39. So you, you get what I'm saying is we're basically witnessing history here in terms of a a run this hot. So I, I know that there's a lot of Becky Lynch fans out there. I hear them on the mailbag every week showing their support, whether it's Becky Lynch, Sasha Banks. There's definitely some uh, some fan favorites, and luckily we have one of them that's a champion, likely going to be champion for a long time, so we're going to have some happy fans, and that's always exciting. I know that's what WWE wants. They want to put smiles on people's faces. You guys all know the whole thing that they say, but I feel like having the championship on Becky Lynch is the right thing to do. It's just, I mean, you guys all know how we feel. It wasn't the right way to do it in terms of squashing Bianca Belair. I feel like there was a different, there was a different way to go about it, but we really don't need to get into that because I mean, that's all hindsight. It it didn't happen. Becky Lynch is the champion right now and Bianca is going to get a rematch, but Speaking of the rematch, it's going to happen Sunday, and the reason why I do think Bianca is likely going to lose, other than, I mean, obviously it's Becky Lynch who just got the championship back, was because she hit Becky Lynch with a KOD here on this episode of SmackDown. So that doesn't guarantee anything, but I mean, you can assume that Becky Lynch is likely going to retain her championship. I feel like this one's almost as much of a lock as the Roman Reigns match against Finn Balor, and which which kind of sucks. I feel like Matt kind of talked about this. I'm not sure if it was his Raw review. I think it might have been or maybe just his weekend review I think it actually was because he was talking about Smackdown so yeah whenever he was talking about Finn Balor and how he really doesn't get the credit he deserves in terms of being like 
an elite superstar in his prime or an, an elite wrestler in his prime, and he's kind of being overshadowed by the bigger stars right now, and hopefully he'll get an opportunity here in the near future where he's not overshadowed and he actually has a legitimate chance to win a top championship like this. And speaking of top championships, is am I mistaken or is a WWE championship not on the card this Sunday at Extreme Rules? It seems kind of weird. I'm looking at the card and I do not see it. But anyway, that's something else for at the end of the show. We'll talk about that. But anyways, I think that it's going to be pretty clear that um, that Finn Balor is not going to win the championship just yet. But hopefully soon we will get there. So let's see. Moving on here, we get our first match. And it is Apollo Crews versus Shinsuke Nakamura for the Intercontinental Championship. And I actually really like this match. I put my phone down. I didn't touch it for the entire match, and I was just focused. And I was really impressed with Apollo Crews. He does have a, a mean clothesline that Shinsuke Nakamura lands on his head. He kind of doesn't do the complete flip. But, it's I mean, it was just a powerful clothesline. I definitely like seeing that from Crews. And, I mean, overall, he just looked damn good. He also hits a drop kick on Shinsuke Nakamura whenever Shinsuke, um, what is it? He, he jumps off the top rope trying to hit a knee or something. I'm not sure what it was, but Apollo Crews hits a beautiful drop kick, kind of similar to like what Randy Orton always did whenever he he would just do that standing drop kick, kind of turn it into a backflip so he lands all right. That's kind of what Apollo Crews did. He caught uh, Shinsuke Nakamura in midair, and it was just a beautiful sight to see, and you like seeing this from Apollo Crews. He's someone that I definitely hope stays on SmackDown. Him and Commander Aziz kind of... They've been a, a staple here, at least because of that that run that he had and the fact that his turn happened on SmackDown. I feel like he just he belongs here, but I wouldn't be surprised if he went over to Monday Night Raw just because on that same coin, Commander Aziz just screams Monday Night Raw. So, I mean, him and Apollo Crews would be a pretty good fit there as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if they end up switching brands. It's actually pretty likely now that I think about it. But speaking of Commander Aziz, Shinsuke Nakamura, he's kind of leaning on the apron, and Shinsuke Nakamura like does like a running knee and kind of hits him, but it doesn't really phase him. He's actually just looked like he it pissed him off, and he started walking towards Shinsuke Nakamura, and that's when Rick Boogs runs over there and kind of comes to the aid of Nakamura, taps on Aziz's shoulder, gets him to turn around, then hits a belly-to-belly -belly suplex, or maybe it was belly-to-back. I'm not really sure, but either way, he suplexed him, so definitely took care of Commander Aziz and just took him out, took him out of the picture. And that's whenever uh, Shinsuke Nakamura was able to get the win. I think this one probably could have been on the card at Extreme Rules. I'm not really sure why they placed it on the SmackDown right before. I mean, literally only 48 hours before that. So that's kind of that's kind of weird. I mean, I feel like the Intercontinental Championship is one of the championships that should always be on the card, especially if you're having a match that same week. Why not just save it? Well, I guess we're kind of just beating a dead horse whenever we're talking about pay-per-view matches and championship matches being on free tv you guys all know the whole shtick with wwe in terms of what they do with their free tv championship matches so i'm not even going to get into that but up next we have a promo from montez ford no angelo Dawkins, so montez ford is solo tonight and i actually think that might be the best thing that could have happened because this was a big night for him he cuts a promo and ends up leading to a match with roman reigns he flat out challenges him he wants a match with roman reigns tonight he has a few choice words for the Usos, and he says that they're not necessarily the bloodline. They're the bloodline you-know-what. You could you could fill in the blank. If you saw, then you definitely know what he said there. And he repeats it later on in the show whenever he's talking to Caleb Braxton, too. He does it in a bit, little bit of a melody. I like that. I like seeing this type of stuff from Montez Ford. And just on a little bit of a side note, since I already kind of mentioned it, and I am going in chronological order here on this show because I'm recording it so soon after SmackDown, I don't have like a... A, a recap or a results website to go off of so i'm kind of just going off of my notes in chronological order so i'm basically just doing like the the highlighted events that happen so bear with me here i mean it's definitely still going smooth but just kind of wanted to let you guys know how it's rolling here tonight but let's see where was i oh yeah montez ford he has definitely some choice words and, and the reason why I, i'm excited for this is because like I said, he's in the main event. He has a one-on-one -on -one match with Roman Reigns. It's not for a title or anything like that, but it's just the exposure is what I'm happy for. Having Montez Ford one-on-one -on -one in a main event on Friday Night SmackDown on the Go Home Show against the Universal Champion, or against the Universal Champion, that's something that I mean he could definitely hang his hat on. He didn't win the match, and we'll get there and talk about it um, a little bit later in the show. But just overall, I, I am excited for Montez Ford. I, I don't want it to just completely just throw Angelo Dawkins off a cliff or anything like that or have the Street Profits just by default split up because I do think there is still some juice left to be squeezed in that tag team. I'm not like annoyed with him. It's not like they're at the point of the New Day 
where they've been around doing the same thing over and over and over again and not really evolving the new or the street profits really haven't had a chance to evolve and anytime they're in the ring they they perform they do well they're not i mean they're their characters are consistent and i feel like it's it's at least more it's more realistic than what the new day are doing i mean the, the new day kind of doing that same thing they've been doing since 2014 the street profits there is a demographic that definitely relate to the street profits just that you know that college age group and i'm not trying to you know stereotype college kids as like people who walk around with like solo cups and just like to party or things like that but i'm just saying like i mean there are people who relate to the street profits i mean they they're a good tag team and i'm, I'm a fan of them and i love seeing montez ford in this type of spot so i definitely hope that it's not something that, that only happens one time i think that He's only scratching the surface and just hearing his promos and hearing him or just basically seeing him as a single star tonight. I know that he's not a single star, but in that role. I mean, if you didn't know, if you were just watching SmackDown for the very first time tonight, you have no idea who Angelo Dawkins is. You're just seeing Montez Ford, this extremely athletic dude, extremely charismatic, who gets in the ring, he performs. And I mean, you're probably blown away if this was your first time watching SmackDown and you see Montez Ford. So I definitely wanted to give him a little bit of, a little bit of a praise here on the SmackDown review because I definitely think he deserves it. But like I said, this promo ends up ends up leading to that match that we talked about with him and Roman Reigns. Paul Heyman tries to talk Roman Reigns out of it, though, because Roman Reigns sees that he's sitting backstage, and he's just a little bit disrespected. He says, I want to match with Montez Ford tonight. Paul Heyman says, well, why would you want to do that? It's only 48 hours before you have to defend your championship against Finn Balor. And Roman Reigns just kind of looks at him and says, why are you still here? And he says, you're right, tonight championship, or not championship, main event, Roman Reigns versus Montez Ford. And that's when Paul Heyman goes and finds Adam Pearce and Sonya Deville. And this was kind of interesting just because they kind of mentioned the draft again. They say, no, we're not going to tell you where Brock Lesnar's getting drafted. I mean, they're kind of just teasing it. They're letting you know it's coming, and he's probably going to get drafted to either Raw or SmackDown. My guess is going to be Monday Night Raw. I mean, he's not in a, a – or I guess he is in that title feud with Roman Reigns, so I don't know. I mean, I expect him to go to Monday Night Raw still. I uh, I think there's enough star power on SmackDown, and obviously we might lose some star power, but I just feel like Brock Lesnar is, is a Monday Night Raw guy because Raw is the flagship show. It's three hours. That's the show that they want to compete with AEW most likely. So, I mean, I, I feel like Brock Lesnar could definitely be a pretty good addition to Monday Night Raw, and it might make the, the people over at USA a little bit happy and uh, safe face a little bit for the WWE. But Paul kind of just brushes that off. He just says, yeah, shut up about Brock Lesnar already. I have a main event for you tonight, and he kind of just pitches it. Montez Ford versus Roman Reigns, and they give him the green light immediately, so the match is official, and uh, it's announced as the main event. So we will get that whenever we get there. But moving on here, let's see what else happened. Seth Rollins cuts a promo basically just asking for a response from Edge. It was a good promo, but, I mean, it was kind of one of those ones that's that's really deep, and it's hard to go word for word, but I feel like it was some good stuff from Seth. I mean, he, he definitely he made it clear that he's not finished with Edge. He, in fact, made it clear that he'll go to Edge's house and uh, get a response from him if he has to. But Edge actually gets on Twitter a little bit later in the show and confirms that he will be on SmackDown next week for night one of the draft. And I don't know what draft format they're going to use, but I really hope it's like the pinball one. I hope all the superstars are back there and they're kind of just doing a little bit of a pinball. If they're going to start from scratch, I would rather them just do like five and five. Like, hey, you get five picks, you get five picks, let's switch it up a little bit and kind of keep the structure, at least for the main part, the same so people can actually have a little bit of an identity and some i guess i don't know like so they can be synonymous with one brand like roman reigns he's been on smackdown for over a year now and just been the face of that brand it was weird seeing him on raw so i want him to stay on smackdown just put people like that even drew mcintyre on raw i feel like he's kind of like a mainstay over there i want to see people stay on certain brands and be synonymous with certain brands but if they don't do that if they start from scratch i want it to be the old school Turn the little pinball thing like Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman whenever they were general managers back, I don't even know what year that was, but whenever they did that draft, and I think it was around like 2004, maybe 2005, I don't know. But either way, that's the one that I wouldn't mind seeing because having all the people backstage, having all the superstars there, the people who don't get drafted on Friday, they could show up on Monday, basically as free agents or whatever, just as draft eligible people being in the green room. I feel like that would be pretty entertaining. We don't need to see the... The executives from Fox and USA having fake war rooms or anything like that. That's definitely not what the people want to see. Let's just let's keep it more realistic in terms of the WWE world. So let's get superstars back there. Let's get some pinballs or something like that. Let's make it fun. Not just people going out there drafting random, you know, people. Like, like last year, whenever 
Raw drafted Xavier Woods and Kofi and not Big E. I felt like that was so weird, especially because the, the entire storyline, or at least the whole idea behind the New Day breaking up, was so Big E could get his singles push. So it would almost make sense that Big E would be the one that gets drafted individually, like saying, no, we don't want the other two, we want Big E. And I feel like that w- that would have been more symbolic for what you were aiming for with Big E. And I just, I, we should have known right there, as soon as it happened, how they kind of did the wrong thing, that they were going to botch it with Big E and his his quote-unquote split from the New Day. So I guess that should have been our um, our hint, and we should have taken it right there, but oh well. Moving on here, Liv Morgan and Zelina Vega. They have their much-anticipated one-on-one match. Liv comes out pretty fast here with a drop kick. That's one thing I wrote down here, and not that long of a match. Carmelo's at ringside, or not at ringside, she's kind of, she's not a guest on commentary, but technically she is on commentary because she's sitting on the commentary table right in front of Pat McAfee, so he has to, like, watch on the monitor. He can't even see the ring. But she's sitting there. Eventually she gets up. I don't know what happens. I guess Liv Morgan does something similar and makes Carmella, rem- or similar to what she did last week to Carmella, and just makes her remember like hurting her nose or something like that. I'm not really sure what triggered Carmella to make her kind of go to ringside and get involved, but Liv gets distracted. I don't know why. And she puts her hands on Carmella and that just completely takes her out of the match. Zelina Vega kicks her in the face, hits some move. I'm not really sure exactly what it was. So that's on me, but she gets the win. Zelina Vega pins Liv Morgan and gets her first win. So I was happy for Zelina here. I mean, I really was despite being a huge Liv Morgan fan. I was excited to see Zelina get a first win. It wasn't a clean victory, but, I mean, who cares? She got the win, and she hasn't gotten one since she's been back in WWE. So definitely enjoy seeing that. I don't know if it's going to lead to anything. I feel like this is kind of like the bottom tier of the women's wrestlers in terms of the pecking order. There's just a whole other level. They're kind of feuding with, uh, with, I guess, with each other, honestly. I mean, Liv's feuding with Carmella, and Zelina's just kind of around. I'm not sure if her as in Zelina and Carmella are going to form a tag team to kind of add another team to that division. I'm not really sure that the women's division on SmackDown is kind of a little bit of a mess at the bottom. At the top, you know what's going on. Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, Sasha Banks, whenever she comes back, if she comes back to SmackDown. But the bottom, that's where it gets a little bit, uh, a little bit sticky. So don't really have much to say there. Liv Morgan, despite getting a lot of wins and seeming like she had a lot of momentum. I know that's a word that's forbidden around here, but Liv Morgan had a little bit of momentum on her side over the past few weeks. That kind of got a little bit halted, at least hit a little bit of a speed bump. She didn't have a clean loss. Carmella kind of got involved, but still, she took the pin. Zelina Vega gets the win, so it is what it is. We will move on from that to a new talk show. This one's called The Happy Talk, hosted by Happy Corbin. And one thing I noticed about this, and I notice this every week, but I don't really comment on it too much. It is so hilarious whenever Pat McAfee buries Baron Corbin. Because keep in mind, I've mentioned it on the show before. They actually know each other. Baron Corbin has a history of being a professional football player. He was he played for the Arizona Cardinals and the Indianapolis Colts. I'm sure most of you already know Pat McAfee used to play for the Indianapolis Colts. He actually played for the Colts for like eight years. So he was there for a while. And um, him and Baron Corbin were teammates and were good friends. So it's no surprise that Pat McAfee actually buries him all the time. He just says that his show is going to stink before it even happens and just com- completely talks crap about Baron Corbin through the entire the entire segment. And it's just fun to see because obviously just uh, the connection that they have in real life and just knowing that he probably enjoys getting a chance to, to rip on his friend on a weekly basis. And this segment about Corbin, it was basically just him bragging about his watch and his suit, which they were impressive. I mean, he, he wasn't lying or anything like that. He was just kind of rubbing it in the crowd's face. Philly obviously is going to let him hear about it, and they just they're chanting "We don't care." And then Corbin eventually introduces himself as his first guest. I guess he felt like he was the only person appropriate to be the first guest on Happy Talk, and his name's Happy Corbin. So I guess it was only fitting. Kevin Owens eventually comes out. He looks furious, like he's about to go to the ring and do some damage, maybe tear it up and hit a stunner on Happy Corbin. But he gets attacked by somebody wearing a hoodie and ends up being Riddick Moss. Yes, that Riddick Moss. I'm sure you remember. The lackey for Mojo Rawley, who ended up having a feud with Mojo and that whole not entertaining thing. He ends up going to Raw Underground and has a little bit of success there, I guess, if you want to call that success. I don't know, but he kind of goes away for a while, and now he shows up and looks like he's going to be Happy Corbin's lackey. I don't know if that's going to last or anything like that, but they got him a little bit of airtime. Maybe just to remind you, hey, remember this guy? He's probably going to get drafted next week to one of the rosters, so we don't want to just completely have it catch you off guard. 
we're going to remind you, hey, he still works for WWE. I don't know. I don't, I don't really get the connection here. Maybe we'll learn more about it. But as of now, it was just nothing. He just kind of attacked Baron or Kevin Owens. And I do feel sorry for Kevin Owens. I really, you know, with all the rumors and stuff going around with him possibly going to AEW, seeing this type of booking where he's just getting buried by guys like Happy Corbin and now obviously Riddick Moss comes out and cheap shots him. Maybe we'll get a little bit of something here at Extreme Rules where maybe they're both going to be there backstage. One of them attacks the other and we can get a match on the pre-show. I don't know, something because... The, ma- the match card this Sunday at Extreme Rules really isn't that long, so it's not like you can't fit more matches on the card. They're all championship matches, so maybe a non-title match is, is something that the card actually needs. So maybe over the weekend we can expect something like that to get announced, or Kevin Owens just might continue to get buried since his contract is up in January, and I hope not. I don't even want to speak it into existence, but he might be out the door and heading to another company that's kicking ass right now, so we'll see if that ends up being... Uh, the outcome there but let's move on here to something that kind of caught me off guard when i heard nikki ash's music hit and her little graphics start popping up on the screen and i seen her come out with the championship belt and i was like oh yeah they won the women's tag team championships and as we were reminded by michael cole they could float through all the brands since they have those championships and this is where michael cole actually lets me know i wasn't aware of this but he tells us that they're actually called super brutality i mean i haven't really tuned into raw that much over the past couple weeks and according to everybody it's been two badass episodes of raw so maybe i should just stop watching maybe i'm the uh the bad luck that's keeping raw bad because i haven't watched the past couple weeks and it's been pretty good so i don't know there might be a little bit of a connection there but that's really why it caught me off guard that they were champions is because i I didn't see the championship happen live. Obviously, I've seen it on social media and seen clips and stuff like that. And they actually kind of – they recapped it here on the show before they went to commercial break. And then whenever we come back to commercial break, we get Nikki Cross – or Nikki Cross. See, even still, it's been months. I literally just called her Nikki A.S.H. like 20 seconds ago and it still slips out. Nikki A.S.H. versus Natalia. And this is literally a three-minute match to end it in a roll-up for uh, Nikki A.S.H., and then Shotzi Blackheart and Tegan Knox come out in their little tank thing and they shoot the tag team champs with a Nerf football. I think that's what they had stuffed in there. That's at least what it looked like, like a purple Nerf football, which probably would hurt if you actually got somebody good with that thing. I'm not sure how, how much power that tank's shooting out there, but if you got them good, and it looks like she was aiming for Rhea Ripley, so if you get if you got her good enough, I'm sure that you would definitely uh, make her feel it. But I think this is just Tegan and, and Blackheart. Knox or Shotzi and Knox whatever I kind of said their opposite names right there Shotzi and Knox they are kind of just you know kind of trying to stamp their name in the women's title picture and I'm sure eventually they'll get a they'll get a crack at those titles not sure if they're actually going to get them I hope so they look like they're a pretty entertaining team Liv Morgan and Tony Storm I hope that they're a team and we saw them last week maybe we could see them again especially if Liv Morgan loses her match against Carmella or something like that even if she wins I'm definitely hoping that she wins but we can get her in some type of tag team with Liv Morgan because Liv Morgan, or not Liv, well, Liv is who I'm is hoping wins. Tony Storm, we saw her backstage with Rick Boogs and uh, Shinsuke Nakamura. That's the only airtime that she got. She really hasn't gotten any match time other than the match she had with Liv Morgan, and I feel like the crowd loved it. The internet loved it as far as I saw, so I think that's a tag team that we should probably keep together as long as possible. But... Let's see here. This is really where SmackDown starts getting pretty interesting, at least in my opinion. The the following segments kind of kind of get juicy. We get Ray and Dominic here next, and they're backstage, and you can see Ray Mysterio is kind of just showing him some film. He has his phone up, and he's showing him highlights of the match and critiquing him. Hey, this is what you're doing wrong. This and that. You you, you know what, how it goes if you've watched film. I'm sure it's the same thing in wrestling. And Dominic kind of just gets upset. He says, "Look, man, you're nitpicking me. I can't focus. You're just you're basically you're doing too much." And Dom and Rey Mysterio says, "Man, you're not even thinking straight right now. I'm just gonna leave." So th- they're definitely arguing, and there is some animosity there. It was magnified tonight. We kind of we've seen little shades of it, a little a little step forward every every week, but it's small things like in the ring. Like we'll, we'll see Dominic wrestle, and Rey Mysterio will do something where it looks like it pisses Dominic off, or it quote unquote costs him the match, or him on commentary constantly critiquing his son or trying to correct what he's doing in the ring. Now we actually get some mic time. We get a backstage segment where they both kind of get to explain, or they don't really explain why they're upset, but we we see that they're upset clearly because Dominic's tone, his body language, he literally tells his dad that he can't focus because he's nitpicking him. 
and Ray is just upset that that even like you have the audacity to say that. Like, wow, like I'm I'm gonna leave right now because you're not even thinking straight. So he leaves, and then Sami Zayn is standing behind him, and he's trying to add or offer some words of wisdom. And I put words of wisdom in quotation marks because it looks like he's doing a little bit of like a snake move here, trying to, you know, maybe put a little wedge in between Ray and his son Dominic because he's kind of saying, "Look, I don't, I don't know. I heard a little bit of that conversation. Just I overheard some of it. Obviously, Sami Zayn just being nosy, but he says like I overheard a little bit of that." And I don't know what he's talking about because I've wrestled some of the best superstars in the world. And you have all the tools to be just as good as those guys if you can just unleash it pretty much is what he was trying to say. He's basically trying to tell him not to listen to his dad. He, he literally said, I don't know, maybe you should not listen to that and and start and continue to do your own thing. So this is where you can kind of see that Sami Zayn is kind of trying to be in Dominic's ear and maybe – lean him towards one direction a little bit, maybe even a possible hill turn for Dominic because he gets so fed up with his dad that we see something like this happen. It's definitely heading in that direction, and I'm excited to see it get to that point. If it, if indeed that's where it's going, then I think that we can all agree and in unison say that that is the right thing to do, have a, have a nice little juicy storyline with Ray and Dominic because I think that they want to do it. And if you can pull back to some of the old school stuff and really get personal here, I think this could be another another juicy storyline that we get going forward. But speaking of juicy storylines, another one happened here. I provided some audio last week for Naomi, and we've all seen how she's been receiving the cold shoulder from Sonya Deville. It's been like pulling teeth for Naomi to try to get a match here on SmackDown. Sonya Deville just won't do it for whatever reason. She has some type of problem with Naomi, and it definitely um it gets exposed a little bit more here tonight because Naomi comes out. It's her entrance. And I wrote finally here in my notes because we finally get to see Naomi come out and she addresses Sonya and then eventually just straight up asks for a match against Sonya. And Sonya Deville declines. She comes out and says she's not she's no longer a competitor. She's her boss. And she makes matches around here. And then um, Naomi is, she's not taking no for an answer. She starts chanting, make that match, things like that. And the crowd gets behind her. Sonya Deville tells the, I guess the production crew. I don't really don't know who it is. Whoever controls the microphone. She tells them to cut Naomi's mic so she can't chant it anymore. She says, cut her audio, cut her audio. And then the crowd picks up where Naomi left off. And they're chanting pretty loud, actually, make that match, make that match. Pat McAfee adds in the background, you can't uh, cut Philadelphia's audio because you really can't, so it was pretty funny. But they continue to chant that. They want to see the match. But I don't think Sonya's going to to budge, at least not yet. This definitely kind of killed a little bit of my confidence, and it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. They could be playing it really well and kind of making us wait a little bit here. I'd be excited to see to see Sonya Deville get back in the ring. Her character, now that, especially now that Ronda Rousey's gone, if she came back and kind of had a little bit of that striking aspect to her game she doesn't have to be an mma fighter kind of like she shifted her character a little bit got her new gear like those black pants she was wearing that's sonya deville if we can get her back i feel like she could probably thrive here on this women's division that could use all the help that it could get especially here with a draft where we're basically starting from scratch it's not like right after wrestlemania like how you get a chance to experiment with new things because you're starting from scratch and you have a whole year to build all your big stuff this is almost like a, a second chance to start from scratch because you're getting fresh brands. You're getting brand new rivalries, brand new storylines, brand new superstars coming to your show that probably haven't been there in a very long time. So it's something to get excited about. And uh, I could see Sonya Deville being a, a pretty big part on one of these divisions, whether it's Raw or SmackDown. So I feel like maybe we can get her back in the ring. But she she doesn't care that the crowd's chanting make that match here in this specific segment. She doesn't care what anybody's saying. In fact, she calls security. She already cut her match, or she cut her mic, Naomi's mic, that is. So Naomi can't even speak. She gets security and says, look, it's your fault uh, that your entrance is the only thing exciting about you, pretty much. After your entrance, it all goes downhill from there, and that's why you're not getting a match. So she kind of blames her and uh, has her get escorted out. And this was one of my favorite segments, honestly. And that's kind of what I told my roommate whenever we were sitting there watching it. That's why I'm I'm excited about SmackDown and I have so much confidence in SmackDown is because this isn't even the main thing. Like, this isn't even the main course. That's the Roman Reigns storyline with Finn Balor. This isn't even, like, Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair. This is, like, third, fourth on the on the totem pole, and it's something really exciting. So that's why SmackDown is really good because they're so deep. Like, they're fourth 
and fifth or maybe even i don't even know because you can include like the mysterios that's interesting too the the little divide that they have going on so smackdown can hold its own against really any show and i feel like that's the if you're going to compare any show in wwe to like an aew show or anything like that like if you're going to compare just the roster to roster i feel like it and, and that's really the top stars on Friday Night Smackdown. It's pretty much Smackdown versus AEW if, if you're talking about ratings. But I know that they're really comparing it to Raw because Raw is the show that they want in terms of WWE. They want Raw to be like the flagship show. They want it to be the, the one that, you know, you're tuning into every week. It has all the juicy storylines because, I mean, it's three hours long. I, I just, and because it's three hours long, I don't think you're going to get that. At, in its heyday, whenever I was a huge fan of Monday Night Raw, it was only two hours and it was a damn good product. And I feel like over these past couple of weeks, at least from what I've seen, I mean, I've listened to the Raw reviews. So I, it's not like I'm just completely blind to what's going on over there. Although I haven't been watching it. It's football season. I don't feel like Raw is really appointment TV, at least the product that we were getting a couple of weeks ago. So I kind of just, you know, cut it out a little bit. Listen to the Raw review. I'm definitely not going to start watching SmackDown, obviously. But as far as Monday Night Raw goes, I'm kind of just looking at it from a distance. So seeing uh seeing it do well over the past couple weeks is is a good sign for sure and I, I feel like all in all wwe is definitely trying to step their game up because let, let, make no mistake about it aw is hitting them right in the freaking mouth right now and and you you love to see it me, me and my roommate literally made the decision tonight dude it's time we start watching aw because i mean why not it's about to get really good this is a good time to be a wrestling fan. You might as well take advantage and, you know, soak it all up while you can. So I feel like Wednesday night's probably going to be uh, an AEW night going forward in my household. But let's see. We talked about Naomi getting escorted out. So now we have the main event. And this was, I expected it to be a pretty damn good match. Montez Ford versus Roman Reigns. As I expected, or as, as I kind of talked about earlier, Montez Ford getting this main event exposure against the Universal Championship, or against the Universal Champion. I don't know why I say that all the time. It's annoying. But anyways, getting a a main event match with the Universal Champion. This is what you want to see for Montez Ford, or at least if you're a Montez Ford fan and you, you're somebody who has said in the past you think he's going to be a star, this is definitely a step in the right direction because I feel like as the little glimpse that we got of a single star on this episode of SmackDown, I liked what I saw. I feel like he can do it. And like I said, I don't want Angelo Dawkins to just get completely blown away and just forgotten. I, I just, I'm excited for Montez Ford is all I really can say. Cause we got a little bit of a taste of it tonight and I definitely want to see a lot more. And uh, during this match, I kind of tweeted this too. I posted a video because it was hilarious to me. Uh, Montez Ford was going to step on the announce table. I'm not really sure what he was going to do, but it broke. And literally, before he could even step, as soon as he put any weight on it, the table just snapped. And Pat McAfee says, is that from my fat ass dancing earlier? I thought that was just pretty funny. Just, I mean, I literally popped whenever he said that because, I mean, he was dancing on the table. And Pat's just a funny guy. Moments like that that kind of just are out of nowhere. That's when he thrives. Have, that, that's when you're going to love having Pat McAfee on your commentary team. Because whenever moments happen like that, that just need a live reaction, there's nobody else that I would rather want covering it. So it's hilarious. And I, I know that there are some people that probably get annoyed with, with his antics and just constantly kind of just seeming like he's joking or at least being a goofball, I guess, for lack of a better word. But, I mean, he, he enjoys it. He enjoys being there. And I think that it's, it's a fun uh it's a fun aspect to the commentary team. I mean, because we've had guys like Byron Saxton, JBL, Corey Graves is pretty good, but I mean, just that vanilla commentary for such a long time. So getting something that you don't really know what he's going to say, you don't know what's coming next. How can you not like that? But anyways, he breaks the announce table. This match wasn't as long as I thought. They kind of had a little bit of, of post-match antics that they had to get to. So they definitely wanted to save a little bit of time. That was pretty evident. So Montez Ford does tap out to the guillotine, even though he does have a nice little, you know, 10-minute uh, showing here. Like I said, it wasn't bad. He definitely performed. He could go again. I want to see him get more of these. Like, he doesn't get enough of this, these long matches where he's not tagging out, where he can just go the entire time and really show his skill set. And It was a good sign, so I hope that, hope that uh, we get more action from Montez Ford going forward. Paul Heyman actually goes in the ring after this match is over. And he claims that what Roman Reigns just did to him wasn't enough for his sins. And uh, Roman needs to show Finn and Brock Lesnar, or anybody else for that matter, what happens whenever Roman Reigns takes it to the extreme. You know, just to get you excited, remind you, hey, Extreme Rules is coming up. Roman Reigns is going to get extreme. So let's see what happens. And the Usos end up coming out because, remember, Montez Ford called them some... Uh, 
some choice names or he had some choice words for them whenever he was addressing them in a promo earlier in the show. And they come out, they put him through a table, and that's whenever Finn Balor, a.k.a. the Demon, shows up. And he starts going to town on the Usos with a kendo stick and even hits Roman Reigns. He ends up standing tall here as SmackDown goes off the air, so you know what to expect. But Finn Balor definitely makes his presence felt. Whoever is painting his body is definitely earning their paycheck because they had to do it last week for just one segment. Now they had to do it this week for just a little 30 seconds of airtime, and now they're going to have to do it again on Sunday because that's who is going to fight Roman Reigns is the demon. So I feel like overall, I mean, with Finn Balor standing tall, Bianca Belair standing tall, what we can expect is what we all predicted. Becky Lynch and Roman Reigns retaining their championships. Nothing really exciting there. So I guess that kind of leads me into my quick predictions here because, I mean, that's all that happened on SmackDown. So let's see. You guys already know. Roman Reigns. I've talked about it a couple times here. Same thing with the women's championship match on SmackDown. I feel like the champions are going to retain. Why not? It makes absolutely no sense at this point in the year to give them to the superstars that they're going against. Bianca Belair, I feel like she could have had the championship and she could have kept going for a while, but her run has been going on for a while. She's still in the main event picture, so she's not going anywhere. I don't feel like this is like the end of the world for her. She's going to get another opportunity at that championship, I promise. So Even if she gets drafted to Raw, that might even be better for her because she's not going to be, you know, kind of overshadowed by people like Sasha and Becky over here on SmackDown. And I know we, we really have no idea. Because this was the last SmackDown, actually, that is these rosters. And that's kind of bittersweet, given that right around the time that I started was the the draft that happened uh, a while back. So back in October, I guess. So it's not too, too long, but about a year ago. So definitely a long time. But anyways, the Raw Women's Championship match. Charlotte Flair versus Alexa Bliss. I think Charlotte's going to win. Uh, Matt's kind of mentioned this in his show, so I'm not trying to just pretend that this is my idea but obviously charlotte flair has kind of played hot potato with that championship she's lost it she won it she lost it well now she's got it back i don't think she's gonna lose it again i mean she's who wwe really wants to establish and she is established as the top woman but you don't want her to lose and this version of alexa bliss i don't think she's ready to be champion right now she she can start winning consistent matches, maybe start kind of evolving back into an in-ring competitor, but until that happens, she's not ready to beat somebody like Charlotte. So I definitely think Charlotte's going to go over here. Triple threat match for the United States Championship. Another championship uh, is going to be retained. I don't think that Sheamus or Jeff Hardy is going to take the championship from Damis, Damian Priest, but if any title is going to change hands on this show... This is probably the one that it's going to be. It just kind of makes sense for it to be. Maybe Sheamus gets it back. But whenever he was champion since he won it at WrestleMania, it was just so boring. I mean, I liked it at first. No, I'm not going to be a fighting champion. You're going to have to earn your opportunity at my title. But that kind of got old because he really never defended it. And he finally lost it. And Damian Priest is somebody who I feel like they're really starting to push. So leave him as champion. You don't have to make a title change just to do it. So there's no reason for this one. Uh, The tag team champions, the Usos, are going to have a match against the Street Profits. And kind of just like Roman Reigns, they just made those shirts with the bloodline and they have all the championships there. I don't think they're going to take the titles off the Usos yet. They're going to have a nice run as the... uh, I believe Paul Heyman called them the best tag team in the world. So it's, it's whenever Montez Ford was insulting them. That's what he referred to them as. Paul Heyman did. He said, well, they talked about the best tag team in the world. And I know a lot of people think that's the Young Bucks. I really don't have an opinion there. Uh, I haven't seen enough of the Young Bucks to say whether or not they're better than the Usos. I, I do know that the Usos are pretty damn good, but I need to I need to watch more of the Young Bucks before I can give like an honest opinion and uh, say whether or not I think they're they're better because I mean I feel like they deserve that. If, if they've got, you know, this type of reputation around the entire wrestling industry, then you know that they probably are pretty damn good. So uh, I probably need to do a little bit of homework there on the Young Bucks before I give an opinion on that specific matchup. But I do think the Usos are going to beat the Street Profits. Just want to make that clear. I think they're going to keep these championships and probably hold them for a little bit longer, at least uh, for the rest of 2021. And the last match, is probably should have mentioned it first, it's the preview match, Liv Liv Morgan versus Carmella. You guys already know what I'm going to pick here. Liv Morgan is definitely going to win this, unless somebody interferes and kind of cheats her out. But I do think she gets to win and kind of wins this rivalry that she's had with Carmella. It wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense for Carmella to win. I I think Liv Morgan is definitely uh, the way to go here in this specific match. 
But that should just about do it here on the SmackDown review. Gave my quick predictions for the Extreme Rules card and also cover the entire SmackDown that I thought was a pretty good one for a go-home show. So definitely an entertaining episode. I enjoyed sitting here getting a chat with you guys. It's always a good time. It's still pretty early, only 10.07 p.m. Central Time, so I'm going to try to get this closed up really quickly here so I can get this sent off to Matt so you guys can enjoy it pretty early. Hopefully, you guys, some of you might be able to listen to this tonight. I'm not really sure when he's going to post it, but either way, it'll be up in the morning for you guys at the very latest. So hopefully, you enjoy it. If you are a first-time listener, thank you for choosing this podcast. Hope you'll continue to do so going forward. If you're a regular listener, thank you for making this part of your weekly routine. Whenever and however you listen, I definitely appreciate it, and hope you'll continue to do that. Hopefully y'all will continue to send in those voicemails and emails to the mailbag. That's definitely one of my favorite episodes of the week. Shout out to all you guys who contribute to that. The Crisis, the Resident Heel Owen, DJ Kuzmo obviously always giving his feedback. Much appreciated. The list really goes on and on. Both Kyle's, casual wrestling fan, Randy the Patron. If I could shout out every single one of you guys right now, I really would. If it's just, I need to just make a list so I could really give you guys an official shout out, but... I do want to appreciate you guys once again for listening. Hopefully you guys will do it next week because I will be back covering the draft. The next week is going to be the actual draft, the first night of the draft. So we'll see what the rosters look like. It's definitely going to be an exciting episode. I hope you guys all enjoy this weekend of wrestling. we got a nice card. Extreme rules. There's some pretty fun stuff going on. Speaking of cards, there's also a UFC event. Not sure if any of you guys are fond of that or if you're UFC fans, but there is a pretty good one that's going to be happening on Saturday night. And obviously all the football stuff. So jam-packed weekend full of entertainment. If you're a sports fan, if you like all time, or all types of sports, you definitely have a, lot, have a lot of stuff in store. A lot of podcasts too, especially here on the WWE Podcast. you got a nice preview and prediction show coming tomorrow. A nice pay-per-view review show featuring the botch guy. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know for sure, but that's usually what happens. So I'm used to an episode with the botch guy, and hopefully we get that. But... Once again, guys, thanks. Hope you guys all have a great night. Walk passionately in the direction of your dreams, and I'll talk to you soon.